since we're all sitting happily so wired together, if you go to computecuj.org DM, uh, you'll see that we have lecture three slides up, and there's a source file that you should download. Keep the .r extension like we did last time, and then do uh, uh, in our studio do uh, 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 open the open the file. So save it. Keep it as .r, and then oops. Not that. Stop that. Uh, it, no, it had gotten unplugged. That's why it took a second to, yeah. Thank you, though. Is there another bad place? Oh, OK. OK, so, um, so we can all do that, right? We've downloaded the .r file, save it with the .r extension, and then we can open it up in, uh, in our studio. See? Yes? Maybe? Yes. Yes. I'm sorry. It's, it's, uh, it's the beginning of a long week. It's, uh, <laughs> um, all right. So. Uh, we're going to have a little bit of lecture, then we're going to look at a little bit of data, then a little bit more data, and then we're going to, well, we're just going to look at a lot of data today. So um, this is the last of our Data Monday sessions. Um, today we're going to talk a little bit about, about like, where R came from and, and why we think it's a good tool for you to use, as well as some things that are going on behind the scenes that will hopefully make some of the syntax and such look a little bit more natural and, and um, maybe feeling a little bit more uh, Cohesive. Uh, we're going to spend a little time with this man. This is John Tukey. Does any of you know who John Tukey might happen to be? So he, among other things, he's the guy who coined the term bit and software. Um, he was a researcher at Bell Labs and is sort of his inspiration behind the process of looking at data is sort of what is living in R. And so we'll talk a little bit about that today. And I think that this is just too awesome of a photo not to have up for a certain amount of time, if only because he's got great tasting glasses. Um, so, uh, uh, so R itself actually began as a thing somewhere in the 60s. Um, if you look at what was happening in statistical computing, and you might think to yourself, why on God's earth would I want to think about what was happening in statistical computing in the 1960s? But again, I told you that you have to sort of understand where the, the junk you're using comes from, sort of what the context is, what the use case is. So. Um, in the 1960s, when people were thinking about statistical analysis, it tended to be done not by an expert. It tended to be done by um, an assistant somewhere. So the expert statistician would just come, the assistant would go and do all the grunt work, and the expert statistician would sit back and maybe thumb through a couple of pages of response and say, OK or not. And that was sort of a, an indirect process of actually looking at data. Um, and there were these monolithic, um, monolithic programs like SAS and BMDP and, and um, PSTAT and, and GenStat even that were sort of these big systems where you would just say, do analysis, and then it would print out all the, all the results for you. So it was, a kind of, it was a kind of glory moment where you would get stacks of, of paper out. In fact, Tukey used to refer to the amount of analysis you did by the side inch because you would get these printouts of paper. And if you did a lot of work, it would be like two side inches worth of work. And if you didn't do very much, it would be like half a side inch. right? It's not very high, the stack of paper. And I'm sure paper isn't going to be a metaphor that re you respond to well. But the idea that, that you had this sort of large, sort of monolithic system. And at, at Bell Labs in the 60s, what you had instead were teams of people working together to try to solve problems, which is more like what happens today when people get together and coordinate around a data set. It isn't a single, it isn't a a single person in charge of doing the analysis anymore. There are multiple people who are all looking at data from different angles. That's especially true when you go out into a, um, into, uh, uh, like my friends who are involved sort of in more data journalism work, I mean, they are part of larger teams, right? So there's a team of people who are all busy looking at the data and not the single person who says, go do something for me, come back and interprets it. Um, so there was this idea about, also about at that time, that the kind of analysis that needed to be done 
wasn't really fitting comfortably inside the big packages. So there was a, a thought to maybe um, so loosen that up. So at this time, Tukey literally wrote the book on exploratory data analysis. There's a book called Exploratory Data Analysis, which for the most part, if you look at it, will be slightly disappointing because it's a whole lot of like hand-drawn graphs. So he's working in a time where you have tracing paper and you draw things. Um, but, but still, he thought um, his, the, the ethos behind what he was doing still sort of holds up. And Tukey, so the quote down here is that exploratory analysis is detective work. It's numerical detective work or counting detective work or graphical detective work. It's somehow digging in the data and finding a story. And the process of exploratory data analysis is a kind of cyclic one um, that, uh, that, he, uh, uh, that we'll see in a second. Um, he was also, for the 60s, this is 19, the year of my birth, 1964, he has a beautiful quote about how um, statistics, and you could substitute the word journalism in here quite easily, um, uh, uh, needs to draw on people who are interested in computer science, needs to draw on people who want to do computing, needs to bring those people into the practice. And if they don't, it's going to set the, the discipline back many years. And this was sort of Tukey saying this in the 60s for statistics. It's sort of come the same time, I think, here for journalism. Um, and at the time, what was interesting um, was that in this sort of mid-60s, you also had the idea that the computer, like pr prior to this, the computer was like a big room, right? And it was something that you submitted a job to, and it was a very special quantity. It wasn't anything like you have now. Um, and in the, in the early or the mid-60s, what you started to have were people thinking about computing a bit like they thought about other kinds of utilities. So like electricity or... Um, or uh, 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 well, like electricity. So um, the idea that you could have computing available to you seven days a week, 24 hours a day, um, and that there would be multi-user systems that were all multi-user systems that people were logging into, and sort of rich kind of man-machine type interactions, um, uh, uh, was sort of a vision that was evolving in the 60s. And somewhere along this time, you had um, a small group of statisticians in the 60s saying, well, if the computer is becoming more and more available, if it's becoming more and more expressive, we could start to do more and more things, then when this idea of a service comes along, the idea that, that you know, computing is, is as ubiquitous as, as the electrical grid, then what would the computer do for us? Um, and this is where you get sort of Tukey starting to sketch on what the computer could do for us. And he produces a memo in the 60s that sort of has this kind of cyclic process of looking at data, where you frame things for the computer, the computer gives you things back, you sort of intuit something, you keep going, and you sort of go in this cycle as you're trying to sort of learn what's there. Um, and I'll, I'll let you read the text. Um, so in the end, then, they, uh, this group of statisticians met and said, you know, what would we like the computer to do for us? And well, what do we want? We want to have easy, flexible, available, the basic or higher level operations, convenient data manipulation, bookkeeping and input-output, I.O. capabilities. Uh, we want to easily modify data, large number of output and input formats, um, and then have a language for, that's adapted to statistical use. And all that work then started to, to like, take shape in the mid-70s and would become a language called S. So you're thinking to yourself, well, R, S, OK, I can kind of get there. Um, and this is the first sketch for S. You'll have to turn your computer sideways. Um, uh, but what we'll see is that the, 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 that the, early, the early seeds of, of, of the tool um, was dealing in sort of rich data objects and then functions that you called on those objects to manipulate them. Um, so the, the, the program that they that was start, started work on in the 70s um, was referred to locally around Bell Labs as the system and became just S in sort of sympathy with the Unix programming uh, language called C. It seemed like a really hot thing at the time to have languages that were only a single letter name. So away you go. Um, and then eventually um, a version of S appears. It was running on Unix systems. Uh, Bell Labs was part of AT&T. AT&T also made Unix. Unix is the thing that's sitting underneath your Mac laptops if you open up a terminal window. Um, uh, but AT&T wasn't really ever able to make any money off of software. They had this sort of a, amazing little piece of, of, of this operating system. They had something like S, but they weren't able to make any money off of it, really. Um, and then fast forward several versions of S, and in the end, the developer of S um, received a fairly prestigious, the Association for Computing Machinery Software System Award, which is sort of a, a big deal. Um, I mean, Linux, for example, uh, Linus Torvalds got it for Linux. Um, and the, the quote for S is that it's forever altered the way people analyze, visualize, and manipulate data. 
Um, R comes in because S is a is a for is a for sale soft piece of software. And you had two uh, two uh, faculty members in New Zealand, um, Ross Ahaka and Rob Gentleman, who wanted to use something like S for teaching, but didn't want to have to buy it. So they started rewriting S from the ground up, and eventually it became R. Rob, Ross, R. <laughs> anyway. Um, this is Rob and Ross now, several years, many years later, looking a whole lot chubbier and a whole lot sort of goatee-er. Um, but uh, uh, since that point, R has really taken off in terms of application areas. You find it in finance, you find it in social studies, uh, social sciences, you find it among journalists. Um, uh, uh, so this is where you've been. Um, and in fact, you can see sort of the effects of R in journalism. The members of the graphics team at the New York Times have a great Tumblr. If you want to just follow how their sketches go from initial R work up to something published. So you'll see something a bit like this, where you get a series of R output like tables, which we're familiar with, or some scatter plots, or some box plots, or some bar plots. You won't see any pie charts here. Um, eventually going over to what appeared in the paper. Okay? So there's this idea that you can sketch with R, do a little work in R, figure out sort of the story, like what's going on, and then, and then hand it over or maybe have enough, enough uh, design capabilities to take the initial sketches and turn them into something uh, uh, that fit for the general public. Um, and it's worth actually spending some time on this Tumblr. There's some nice case studies there. Um, all right. so. And actually, the, the other, maybe journalism, this is Tukey again, much, much older, without the glasses. Um, uh, uh, ca casting data analysis, um, or maybe rather um, anthropomorphizing data as having a voice, right? And that the really good data analyst only has to listen to what the data have to say. So in, a, in, a, in effect, it's a kind of interview process, right? So if you can just speak to the data somehow, have a little back and forth. That's that process that he's outlining. You'll see what it has to say, as opposed to coming to the data with a series of, of preset questions. What's the unemployment rate? What's the average weight of someone living in blah, blah? What's, you know, instead of coming with a set of questions, the data form a, a kind of question uh, back. All right, so where are we then? So for the last couple lectures, um, uh, we've looked at some basic data types in R. Um, we've looked at uh, 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 also how to organize them into some simple data structures, so simple columns or groups of columns, which then become a kind of table. Um, and the end of last lecture, we saw how we could use packages um, in R to extend its capabilities from simple data types like numbers and characters and logical to uh, spaced, so things tagged, points tagged in space or time, things occurring in time. So you can go from simple, simple objects to, um, to more complicated ones. Um, and the, 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 um, the tools we use, like map tools and Lubridate, the, which you, you used for your assignment, maybe, um, were, uh, are all things that are community developed. Right? They're things that don't come in core R, but they're offered by others. Um, and in fact, one of the great uh, innovations that R provided over S was the ability for people to share packages, to contribute packages in one place, that place called CRAN that you've been to, um, so uh, uh, th that allow it to extend easily. There wasn't an easy way to extend S, or it wasn't so commonly used before. All right, so just to review quickly, we've seen certain data types. For example, we've seen vectors of numerical data, where that C is just a function that asks us to combine a bunch of data. Here we're combining 2, 3.5, and 1,000.05. And that's it's stored in a kind of numeric uh, vector. We've also seen character data, low handstand light bulb, um, all in quotes. That becomes uh, a vector of class character. Or logical data, where we have trues and falses. Okay. Um, you can also move between these types. We've seen this, but without using sort of specific language around it. You can coerce one type into another. So you can force R to say, if my vector is really x, 2, 3.5, and 1,000.05, which we know to be numeric, those, that's, that's num those are numbers, um, we can f make y be a character version of x. And if you look at it, it's, it's exactly the same as x, except it has double quotes around it. And now it's the string 2 and not the number 2 anymore. So it understands it as 2, like you might see 2 in a paragraph, but not 2 like the number 2 is less than 3 and bigger than 1. OK, is that clear? Um, and you can go back again. So if you have 5, 23, and light bulb, all in quotes, you can say, let's convert those back into something numeric. And it'll give you 5 and 23, because it can do it. But it doesn't know how to turn light bulb into a number. And so you're going to get something called an, an A. 
Um, and NAs are R's missing values. So you've probably seen a few of them as we've poked around um, with, with code that um, uh, that act of coercing light bulb into a number, um, uh, R says, gosh, I don't know what to do with that. I have no idea. I've never seen it before. I don't know. And rather than guess, I'm just going to say I can't do it and give you an NA, right? a, a missing value. Um, also, uh, R is one of the benefits of R over, say, Excel, is that it has a consistent um, handling of missing values. So if, that, if we take that Y, um, that y vector, which now has the number two, the number five, the number 23, and an NA in it, and we take the average, it'll give us back a missing value. Because it'll say, I don't quite know how to average 5, 23, and something that's missing. Right? I, don't, I don't know what to do there. So rather than try, it's just going to say, I'm going to leave it missing. Um, if you want to have it leave the NAs out, you can add an argument, na.rm, na.remove, equal true, and it will go ahead and take the average of the things that it can, the 5 and the 23, which should pr produce 14. Okay? So R is being a little bit, a little bit um, careful about missing values. And in the data we're going to look at today, we'll see a series of missing values. And actually, you played with that if you tried the assignment over the, over, well, didn't really give you much time for it. but. Um, uh, Adventureland, by the way, was kind of awesome. If you haven't been to Adventureland in, on Long Island, um, it, is, it was an absolutely amazing, anyway. Um, all right, so, uh, so you, anyway, you can deal with, with NA. So when you, when, you, when you take the mean of something or the sum of something and it gives you back an NA, it means that somewhere along the way there's some missing values. Right? So it's a clue that something's gone wrong. And so you can fix that, by, or you can address that by first looking at where the missing values are, figure out why they're there, and then if you choose to, ignore them. Okay? And go ahead and take an average over what you can. Um, there's one last data type that you're going to keep hitting again and again um, that sits somewhere between characters and numbers. Okay? So remember last time we talked about qualitative data and quantitative data? Um, uh, R uses something called a factor to represent qualitative data. You'd think that sort of character strings would be enough, but it, it um, there's, we'll come into some good reasons why there, you might need something more. So suppose you have a survey where you're asking people their satisfaction over something, right? Like, um, you know, how amazing has your first three three weeks now, three weeks in a day in three weeks in a day in, in journalism school been, or how satisfied are you, low, medium, high? What have you, right? So you can you can think about um, a survey that has answers low, medium, high as the as the res, as the response. Um, and suppose we talked to nine people, and I only did nine because if I did ten, the thing would wrap and that wouldn't work. So, so suppose we have data on five people. So low, low, high, low, medium, low, high, low, low, um, and then we can turn that thing into a factor instead of being character data, which is what it is now. We can call the second line there says factor of y, and we can give it levels, low, medium, high. Okay, so we're telling R that this thing is, is a factor, and it has, in this case, these three levels. And when we print out z now, we just don't see the things in quotes, low, medium, high. We see low, medium, high as, as labels, and then we see the levels of the factor being low, medium, high. Okay. You can, use them in, in, you can use this data much in the same way you would use character data, in the sense that you could take a table of that value z, and it'll tell you that there are six lows, one medium, and two high. And you can also ask it to be, uh, you can coerce it to be a character, which will give you back just low, mediums, and highs. Okay? But the interesting thing here is you can also coerce it to be numeric. Remember, R didn't know what to do with light bulb, and R technically doesn't know what to do with low, medium, high, unless it's a factor. And then in this case, the numeric piece will give you back one for low, two for medium, and three for high, because low is the first level, medium is the second level, and high is the third. And that's why you get one, two, three. And you could, if you wanted to, take an average of that. So if the one, two, three, low, medium, high was a Likert scale, it makes sense to sort of average those, right? Um, or you know, extremely dissatisfied, satisfied, so-so, what have you. Like you could turn those back into a number scale, then the average sort of makes sense, and you can do that. Um, uh, oftentimes in R, again, uh, uh, well, and then and then you can ask for the levels of z, and it'll tell you it's low, medium, high. Okay. So a factor is sitting somewhere between um, a, a, a character vector, like the, just the words, low, medium, high, and a numeric vector, which is 1, 2, 3 for low, medium, high. Okay? So it has those two faces. Um, it turns out that um, uh, uh, 
it turns out that when you read data into R using read.csv, um, by default, what it does is it turns all the column, it, it tries its best to guess what kind of data you've got. So if it looks like they're all numbers, which is just a bunch of numbers with periods, as soon as you get a comma, by the way, it goes, Ugh. But if they're just numbers with you know, num digits and periods, then it'll turn those into numeric data. And other things, it will, it will turn into factors. right? It'll basically say, well, it should be represented as something like a character, and I'm going to assume you mean a factor. Um, so that's its default behavior. And you can ask you know, whether that's a good idea or not in our um, in Oh, this was in the Stabile session. If you want to turn that off, there's an argument to read.csv called as.is, which basically, if you say as.is equals true, it says don't screw with the character vectors. Just leave them as character vectors. Don't turn them into factors. Leave them as is. Okay? And sometimes you want to do that. Um, all right, so um, let's see. Um, so, so here we have another. Uh, um, uh, another example, so handstand, light bulb, and pineapple, whatever being just the, that being sort of a group of text that's read in. Um, you can say, if that's a character vector called y, you can let z be the factor of y. And what it'll do is it will just run through and give you as levels the alphabetized version of whatever the unique values are there. Okay? So it'll take the unique values in your vector, and then it'll alphabetize them and use them as the levels. Um, and then when you turn them into numeric, you get you see that handstand is number one. So everywhere there was a handstand, you see a one in that array. Okay. Um, again, this is going to come up when you start to do. The reason this this comes in handy is when you start to do things like um, uh, modeling, uh, like formal statistical modeling. And if we have some time, we'll, we're going to talk about a, a model today because I feel like that's an easy concept that um, we can we can talk about that doesn't. Um, uh, that doesn't need to be quite so mysterious. But um, for certain models, you, you might want to include something like gender as a variable. But to be able to do that, you're going to want to be able to code it into 0, 1, let's say. And that can be done through this sort of factor mechanism. And we'll come back to that. Is that clear? So with character, numeric, logical, and factors, you have sort of all the basic data types that R knows about. Okay? Those are the built-in ones. And then later, you can add new um, packages that give you access to space and time. Um, all right, so in your homework then, um, uh, 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 th this is why um, uh, in your homework or in the assignment that you had, at some point we used this package called Lubridate, which took things like 1.10.2013 and turned it into an actual date object. That is, it recognized that 1.10.13 comes um, before 1 11, 2013, and so on, right? It has some notion of the ordering that isn't just as a string anymore, but as an actual date. And that you could do computations, like figure out how much time had elapsed between two dates. But the input to the date function wanted a character string, not a factor, which is why we were specifically doing the as.character um, uh, as uh, uh, in your homework. Um, so you should keep in mind what kind of data you're working with, whether it's, it's numbers or characters or logical or factors, so you're not surprised by the computation. Um, so for example, x being 1, 2, and 12 in quotes, it's important to remember that those are characters. It's 1, 12, 2, right? It, it's the character versions of those and not the number 1, which is bigger than 0 and smaller than 2. Um, and so when you ask for its class, it says its character. And when you try to take its average, it doesn't know what to do. Because it's like averaging words in a paragraph. It doesn't know what to do. Um, but if you turn it numeric and then take its average, it can do it. Right? So there's an important thing. One thing I've been noticing when, when you've sent me questions, um, some, sometimes it's, it's important just to keep track of sort of where, like what, it, what the object is you're looking at. Right? What kind of thing is this? And what am I trying to do to it? Um, and that, uh, uh, that, might help, um, that might help you uh, uh, understand some of the admittedly awful um, uh, error messages that R gives when it gives error messages. When you do something wrong, it's not very often very helpful. Although I can say that there are about three independent projects now that are busy trying to make R's error message a little bit more friendly, because they're not particularly friendly at the moment. Um, all right, so then from these types of data, we, we took each of these, these basic types, and we then assembled them into, um, into data structures, um, like a column of numbers um, 
or a data frame where each individual column has a particular type. So there could be a column of numbers, or a column of characters, or a column that's a factor. Um, uh, so, um, right. So in, um, in terms of storage, then, we've seen simple one-dimensional structures like x being green, blue, green, blue, so a vector. That's the C, this combined, puts us into a vector that we've indexed with just square brackets. So we can take the second element or the second third element. Um, and we saw rules for subsetting. So we can subset with specific choices, 2, 3, 4, or with negative, like minus 2, minus 3, which would give you everything but 2 and 3, um, uh, and so on. Um, We've also seen that you could take those pieces and turn them into, um, into a two-dimensional structure. So take the colors, green, blue, green, orange, green, um, and maybe add that to, to it another color or another, another uh, variable. In this case, let's say you call it quantity. So we'll create a data frame that has two columns, one called color, one called quantity. The color has just a vector of colors attached to it, and the quantity has just a vector of numbers attached to it. And then if we look at the data frame, we see it printed out in that familiar square or rectangular form. Um, and then that thing, we've learned that we can subset again with square bracket notation, but now we have a comma in between. So anything that we put before the comma refers to rows, and anything after the comma refers to columns. Um, and um, hopefully by now, well, and then also um, with data frames, uh, you can also, in addition to, to subsetting columns using numbers, you can also um, uh, ask for their name specifically with this dollar sign notation, right? So you could pull out just the quantity or just the color with this dollar sign business. Um, uh, Mark, yes? Uh, in, the, in the assignment, there was this really weird notation where like, you were, uh, you're removing a data set of one without a date. Uh huh. Right. Right, that's right. So that's like what's happening here. So df2 colon 3 comma. Right? So what we're saying is so with a single with a single object like this back here x, we pick off individual numbers 2 3 4 2 3 4 5 what have you, right? We're doing individual numbers in the square bracket. Um, when we have a data frame, we have two two choices. We have rows and we have columns. So when we're selecting a piece of data, we can select data from certain rows and from certain columns. We indicate which rows we want by um, the subsetting rule we put before the comma, and we indicate what columns we want by the subsetting stuff after the comma. And if we leave stuff out, like there is no indication, then it just gives us everything. So here, for example, two comma means give me the in the second row and every column. Okay. If we wanted the second row in the first column, we'd be 2, 1. Okay? If we wanted the second row and the, well, there, is no, there's no, there are no other options. So you could do df2, 2, 2, which would give you second row, second column. And df2, just gives you everything in the second row. And similarly, when it's comma 1, it's saying, give me all the rows for the first column. Okay? That sort of subsetting was a little tedious in the assignment, but that sort of subsetting seems to be a big chunk of what you s might spend your time doing before a data analysis, getting the data sort of put into a kind of shape that it could be used. Um, and then finally, um, we've been looking at um, how we process data. So we've taken the data, we put it into various forms, and then we process it. Um, and we process it by invoking one or more functions. Okay? Um, so functions are really the heart of R. You saw John Chambers in his little Spiel in 1972 saying the thing about S is it's all about, it's all about operations on data and structures or objects to hold that data. So, um, uh, um, so we've seen computing numerical summaries like the mean and percentile. We've made simple graphics. Um, and at some level, learning R is a little like a vocabulary lesson because what you're learning is what are the things I can do to data? What are those verbs? What kind of plotting can I do? What kind of graphs can I make? What kind of summaries can I compute? What kind of models can I make? Um, there is a, a leg up, though, on this, because um, R, R specifically invokes something called, and this is a $12 computer science term, but polymorphism, meaning a function adapts to what you call, what kind of data you call it on. So for example, when we made a map at the end of last, uh, last lecture, 
We read in precincts using reshaped spatial from the map tools package. The object um, precincts, we created this thing called precincts, and it's a class spatial polygons data frame. So it kind of behaves like a data frame, meaning it has columns of certain, of certain data, rows referring to different precincts. And then in addition to the, the data on each precinct, it also has an extra little piece that describes the precinct shape. Okay? So it's like a data frame, but it has an extra column that describes the shapes for each precinct. Um, and all we did was plot precincts, and it gave us that. Right? And we asked for text on those precincts, and it gave us the numbers. Okay? Um, similarly, uh, in the homework or in your, in your session, what you were doing was taking, um, uh, taking, two, uh, 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 taking, taking two columns like um, my date, right? the, we, we made dates out of the, date of, the, of the campaign contributions. We put that on the x-axis, so it's my date, comma, and then the cumulative sum of the uh, of the of the uh, of the amounts that people had contributed to uh, to uh, the the two campaigns. In this case, we're comparing Quinn and 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 Wiener, um, and we saw that that it's the same command plot. It just has two different arguments. In this case, it's a time thing and some numbers, right? And if you if you plotted two numbers. Right, some numbers and some other numbers, some numbers, comma numbers. It would give you a scatter plot, just a set of points. So, I guess what I'm yes. Zero. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm missing. Oh, right. So it says x lab equals year, y lab equals that one. Oh, oh, on the chart. Oh, that's 4 times 10 to the 6th. Sorry, that's dorky scientific notation. <laughs> 4 times 10 to the 6th. Sorry. So 0, E, 0, 0, that's 0. That's an actual 0. Um, uh, and then you go up 2 times 10 to the 6th, 4 times 10 to the 6th, times 10 to the 6th. Okay, So you're looking at the amount of money that's being raised. Sorry about that. Um, so, um, so, so I guess my point here is that in, in this case, we're plotting spatial data. And plot of that data gives you a, like a kind of amazing spatial plot. And here we're doing plot of time and cumulative um, contributions. And it gives us a line plot. Okay? But all we had to remember was the word plot. right? That, that R will adapt what kind of plot is appropriate for the data that you fed it. right? So, so somehow, while learning R feels like a vocabulary lesson, it may be one with a slightly lower, lower like a, a maybe a lower level of vocabulary, because certain functions like plot are, can be called on just about any object and then adapt to the type of object that it is. Spatial plots get space plots, time plots get time plots, and, and so on. Okay, um, which hopefully makes R a little easier to learn. Maybe <laughs> you can just go ahead and try plotting whatever it is and see what happens. Right. Um, okay. Um, and then finally, um, just to maybe demystify, when we're calling a function, what we're doing is we're providing it with arguments, right? So, like we had plot of precincts, and we're just having it plot the object precincts, right? It's figuring out which version of plot to use and and invoking that. Um, uh, uh, so. Um, so we had some conditions like that. And then other, in other times, we're passing arguments to functions like type equals L for type equals line. So sometimes the arguments are named, and sometimes they're unnamed. And that might be a little mysterious. Um, what's basically happening is the following. So if we want to make a histogram, we see in the help function that the, 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 the arguments that it wants is something called x, that re so sort of midway down the page, something called hist of x, that's the data, breaks. That represents how many breaks it wants, or an algorithm for computing those breaks. Um, whether or not you want it to be computed as um, uh, a frequency representation, or maybe normalized to give you a density. And there are a series of options. And maybe one of them down toward the bottom there is main. So you can, you can give it a different name. Instead of histogram of, you can give it a different name with the main equals. Okay? So all of those are arguments that are, free for you, that are open for you to specify when you want to create a histogram. Um, and so what we're doing. Um, so, so what R does when you give it some data is it tries to kind of match up and figure out what you, try, what you meant. So um, 
First, what it'll do is it'll say, um, let me match all the data you've provided me with the names you've given it. So if I want to make a histogram of the amounts that people have of the, con the campaign contribution data, I give breaks equals 50. R is going to say, all right, that means you want 50 breaks. That the, uh, the argument here, breaks, will get the value 50. Um, and then main, because again, it's named, main will get the value histogram of contributions. Okay, so having gotten rid of all the things that have names and made those associations, it then says, well, the amount hasn't been specified. The CC dollar amount, I don't know which of the arguments it's supposed to go to, so I'm just going to give it to the first one. It'll be my data. Okay? So what R does when it matches up uh, arguments to a function, you could, if you want, like all these three will produce the same plot, you could name everything. Say x, my data is given to be the amount, the, you know, the contrib campaign contribution amounts. Breaks is 50, and the main is histogram. That, that's very clear as to what you expect to have happen. My data are going to be the amounts, 50 breaks with this title. Um, or I could be looser and say CC dollar amount, the, the, the data, 50 and main. And that'll give me the same plot. Because what R will do is say, all right, I see that you want to have the, 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 the main title for the, the plot to be called histogram of contributions. I now have two groups, two things left over that I have to assign to arguments in the function. And what I'll do is say, well, the first one will go to x, and the second one will go to breaks. OK, because I have two left over, and I just put them in order of my arguments. OK? So that's why, in some cases, it, it and I apologize if it looks mysterious. In some cases, we're giving things names. and some cases, we're not. And the reason oftentimes that we don't is because, uh, again, R has this very simple rule. It'll give things names, name things first, and then just slot in everything else afterwards. Okay? And in the case of histogram with, with, with some data, that data is the first argument, so it's always going to get matched up first. All right, so let's see. So what we're going to do next is, um, is actually some new stuff. Um, so uh, what we're going to do is um, have a look. We promised we'd have a little bit of a look uh, um, at, uh, at some Twitter data. It's slightly irritating that the title of the, of the paper is cut off here. But um, the title is uh, On the Study of Diurnal Urban Routines on Twitter. And they start looking at you know, counting when various kinds of terms get used, like sleep or lunch or funny. Right? Posting searches to Twitter and counting the number of tweets that come back with those individual searches. Okay? So what we're going to do is spend a little time on Twitter and invoking Twitter as a kind of something computational and see what we can make of that. Um, uh, let's see. So uh, this got a little bit of bounce in the press, this idea that you could look at Twitter and look at the things that have been tweeted and see um, and see when uh, 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 see when um, when uh, uh, when things were happening. Also, there's a, we're going to look at um, uh, uh, we're going to look at a, a fairly hot, although slightly annoying, topic of sentiment analysis and see how graphs like this are made, where um, on the y-axis you have people tweeting with more positive words versus less positive words than as a function of time of day for the weekends and weekdays. The idea being that maybe people are happier on Saturday night than they are on Wednesday night. Um, and there's a, a ton of, of projects out there like this. Um, or attempts to try to maybe uh, find where sort of angry tweets are coming from. So the idea that somehow you could take text as language and figure out something about the intent of the people who are tweeting. Um, and we're going to skip tart. All right, so the, the example we're going to use then today comes from this paper. Uh, it came out um, winter last year called The Geography of Happiness. Um, uh, uh, and it basically looks at um, everything you could pull from some, from some measure of happiness about tweets. Um, the original post from The Atlantic is here, um, the blog, and then there are auxiliary resources here. Um, you can download the data and so on. The research is done by a group in um, Vermont um, uh, and builds on their data uh, or their experience trying to attach mood to tweets. Um, 
And uh, we have, uh, you can either download from that link this data set s1.txt, or you can get it from, uh, from our uh, compute-cuj.org um, slash dm. There should be a, um, if you go here, you'll see data set s1.txt. Okay. So this is going to be the data we're going to look at, at least initially. Um, and again, this is under the title of text as data, and this is a, a sort of an early way to get at that. Um, so uh, if we have a look, um, this is where it would be nice if you had um, the uh, source up. Um, so if you have that loaded in your R Studio, it'll have you read.csv, the, the data coming in. Um, uh, rather than import the data set by looking at your um, uh, uh, data, um, the uh, uh, workspace import data set tab, instead type read.csv, give it that URL or the URL of the original paper. Um, the separator here we're going to use is backslash t, uh, backslash t uh, for tab, because this turns out to be a, a tab. Um, Tab separated data instead of comma separated, right? Um, broadly, comma separated values or any sort of delimited values, as long as you, as long as the delimiter isn't confusable for data, you're good to go. So here, uh, another common format. In addition to comma separated values, you'll you'll see is uh, tab separated values, and so here everything's been tab separated. Um, also, in this case, the missing values are indicated with minus minus. Okay, so it, uh, we'll talk about what the data are in a second, but if there isn't a value there, it's given minus minus. And those blank spots there are actually minus minuses. <laughs> um, it's unfortunate, but. Um. So, yeah, so hold on. So, um. oh, sorry. Ugh. Oh. No, 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 I, I'm just clicking around wildly now. So I don't know who the last one was for this, but. Um, um, right, so here's the, here's the, the code. Um, so we have separator equal tab, then skip equal three. The reason we're doing that is because um, the data set has some header material that says that this is um, lab MIT 10.txt language assessment by the Mechanical Turk space, and then it gives you the titles of the columns. So we need to skip three lines before we get into the data. Is that clear? The top three aren't really anything. Is there another question? Yeah. Sorry, can you just clarify this? Any tab three equals minus minus? Yeah. Like no, that means just turn, if it, when it sees those, turn them into NAs. Okay, so um, if you if you source that in, hopefully you'll see you have a happy data frame, literally a happy data frame, um, and the variables you're going to see are word that is um, well actually how how big is this data set? How many observations do we have? Ten thousand. Great, um, and for each of those then is a word. So if we take happy, the first row, or actually you can just go, um, might as well use the data viewer since we have it. Um, you see a, a happiness rank. Uh, so you have a word, a happiness rank, the average happiness. We'll talk about how that was scored. The happiness standard deviation. Um, it's Twitter rank. It's Google rank. It's New York Times rank. And it's lyrics rank. Um, so. Um, what these data are is they um, basically ten th each row is a word, um, uh, uh, and they've been scored according to how sort of happy they feel, right? So on the top end of this, and these are the the data has been sorted according to that happiness score. The score goes from zero to ten. Um, so we see things like laughter, happiness, love, laughed, laugh, laughing, excellent, laugh, joy. Win, pleasure. I think puppies are up here somewhere. I desperately want a puppy. Um, funny, paradise, freedom. And then you go all the way to the bottom, 
and it's uh, um, oh, that's just oh, we only get to the the first thousand. So if you um, if you tail that, you'll see that the the words on the bottom are like death, murder, terrorism, rape, suicide, terrorist, like like really unpleasant words, right? So. So at least it's somehow these scores are, are doing a, a some, something somewhat reasonable. Um, you can do tail um, n equals 100 and have a look at um, the last 100. So again, these are sorted according to it. So deaths, arrests, jail, murdered. <laughs> Cry, cruel, sadness, evil, depressing, earthquake, poverty, bombs. All right, these are some again not so happy words. Okay. All right, so that's that's the the data. The ten thousand words come from um, come from three sources. Um, they come from uh, a database uh, uh, of uh, from Google Books. So they look at the top five thousand words from Google Books. They look at the top 5,000 words used in the New York Times, the top 5,000 words used in a, in a data set of lyrics, uh, popular music lyrics, and the top 5,000 words used on Twitter. Right? So if you take all those 5,000s and you intersect them, what you get is this 10,222 words. OK? Is that clear? They had to get the words from somewhere. Right? So they looked at, at words based on um, these five are these uh, uh, four sources. Um, so what's in use on Twitter, what's been historically used through Google Books, what has the New York Times been writing about, and what, what are we sort of, I guess, crooning about. OK? Um, so. The paper itself is called The Geography of Happiness, and it tries to take every tweet. I think they're sitting on some number of millions of them. And each tweet is scored for its happiness using this kind of happy data. We'll come back to exactly how that's done in a second. Um, they uh, uh, push this idea to the absolute limit. So um, uh, they'll make maps, right? So something on the order of 5% of, of, of tweets are, are uh, geotagged. So they took the ones that were geotagged, um, and the happier they are, I think uh, red is happier, blue is sadder. Um, so thankfully, Midtown Manhattan is a fairly happy place. It sort of extends up to where we are. Um, uh, and then, like I said, push it crazy, like crazy to figure out where are the happy cities and the not so happy cities, the happy states and the not so happy states. Um, and then even try to correlate happiness with other, um, with other measures. Um, so uh, uh, things like um, uh, from the behavioral risk factor surveillance survey, how much exercise do people get in a city, correlate that with how happy their tweets are, that kind of thing. Um, and then looking at particular cities that people are tweeting from, Napa, uh, there are lots of California. It turns out to be very happy places. Um, and then uh, on the other side, the low happy scores, um, uh, other places. Okay, so they sort of work the heck out of the data. So, um, so the way a, a, tweet, a tweet gets scored is, is pretty simple-minded. Um, so they have the sentence, let's say, laughter is the best medicine. Suppose someone tweeted that. Um, they would then look at the words, laughter is the best medicine. Um, look those up in the table of, of happiness. They find that laughter is an 8.5. Is is sort of a neutral word, so it's only about a 5. Because again, 5 is in the middle of the happy, not so happy scale. Um, the is, again, smack dab in the middle. Um, uh, best is, is high, and medicine, somehow I would have thought medicine would have been a bit, I guess, it's, uh, you know, there's a plus and a minus to it. So anyway, um, and then the overall sentence has a score. They take those five words, just take the mean, and it gives it a score of 6.18. Just out of curiosity, how might we, how might we interpret a score of 6.18 for a tweet? Is that happy, not so happy? 
It's pretty. <laughs> so what we could do is bring this back to our data set and look for words that are about like 6.18. So bring it down. Oh, we don't get that low. Um, we could ask. We could do some subsetting, right? We could ask for, um, let's say, uh, calibrate um, happy where happy dollar. Let me just get the names right. Um, let's say it's bigger than, uh, let's say, 6.15, and happy is less than maybe 6.2. So there are 120 of those uh, words that are in that range. And they're words like this. So somehow the tweet, laughter is the best medicine, in terms of the happy scale, is somewhere, somewhere in here. Right? These are all things that are about six point, between six point. Uh, 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 so how is this eagle sailor dynamics engaged? It's, I don't know. I'm trying to come up with some calibration. Yes? If it was a non database, would this still make the decision as to be like, if, it, if it was a. If it was a not oh, the word not. not. Right. Happiness is not right. Well, because you could ask what score, what, what, is this, what score does not have? Because if there are more words that are you know, happy, then. Sure. How would we find out which, what the score that not, is not one of our words? Probably. How could we, how could we, how could we decide that? So we could use one of these logical operators, percent in percent, and we could say, is not in, in our words? Yes, it is. And so you could say, happy, where happy dollar word equals not. Take that row out. Again, nothing after the comma. Oops. It's really a comma. And you'll see that not has a really low score. It's 3.86. So not would bring it down. We'd average it, and it would bring it down. Um, but it, it may, right? So the, the obvious problem with this as, a, as, a, as an algorithm is that there's no understanding of the semantics. There's no understanding of what the sentence structure is, none of that, right? It's a very brute force system. But it does give us an opportunity to talk about how we might brute force manipulate text, OK? So I'm not pitching this as, as the awesome way to score, um, to score sentiment, and yet, this is a paper that, that um, received a fair bit of attention, was written up in the Atlantic, right? This is, has some bounce. Yes? How would this be determined? Like, who decided that not was good? That's a good question. We'll come to that. Yes? I, you know, 6.18, but yeah, I, I don't, um, I think so. I think because I don't have anything else to go by, right? So I have a happiness scale of a certain of a certain number, and I don't know what else to calibrate it by. So I'm going to look for words that all seem to be in that sentiment. For example, if it scored really high, like the words were made up of laughing, giggling puppies, right? If that was my if that was my tweet, it would probably be very like up in the up in the eights or nines, and we could calibrate that with laughter and expressiveness. And if it was like you know, dying, ulcerous, something or other, then it would be down toward the bottom. And so I'm just trying to, to suss out what's in the neighborhood of that number. I don't really have a lot to go on. Yes? No, so, so right, no, 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 so this algorithm, this algorithm sucks, right? There's no sense in which this is an awesome thing, right? And, now that I'm finding that we're putting these on in public, I'm not I'm not entirely happy about that. But but anyway, I wouldn't I, I wouldn't I wouldn't bet the farm on this, right? I wouldn't even bet like a small piece of farm equipment on this, right? Like this is not this is not the but and yet as as a as a thing that gets us talking about how one might process text, it's actually not bad, 
right? So I wouldn't advise it. Don't do this at home, but it does give you something to work with, right? All right, so we have a pretty simple data set. Is it clear where the data are, right, so far? I mean, I'm coming back to your question about where 3.86 came from, but are we, is it clear? We got the words by looking at the top 5,000 words on four sources, Google, New York Times, a lyrics database, and, um, and uh, uh, Twitter. Um, and then um, where we got the scores, so if you want to put this all together, you could say, well, where would such a list like this come from? Um, and again, we go back to the Mechanical Turk. So I think we mentioned this the first lecture, the idea that um, there are uh, uh, crowdsourcing platforms that pay people small amounts of money to do simple tasks. Um, the Mechanical Turk taking its, its name from a, from a story of a chess-playing robot that turned out to actually be um, a person in a box, uh, I don't know, some 1800s. You can look up the Mechanical Turk. Um, uh, but the idea that, that there are tasks that humans are really good at that computers aren't so good at. And so um, on sites like this, you can pose at least the way Amazon's framed it, something called a HIT, a human intelligence task, which is something that the human is supposed to be better at than the, than the computer. Um, and there are a variety of hits for you to choose from. Um, uh, I've posted a few in the past, and the, the ones that get the most immediate uptake are things like, look at this image and tell me if there's a puppy in there. right? Or look at this image and find any text that's in there. Right? So in effect, oftentimes people use the Mechanical Turk as a way to train data for computer processing. So if I want to create a computer vision system that can read the text in an image right, and highlight where the text is in a computer, like if I take an image, right, that image is just a series of pixels. It's not organized to know that there's, a, there's some text in it. But I might be able to train a computer to find the text in the image. Right? And so for that, I would need to have some training data that said, here's an image, and here's some text that's in that image. Right? But it's a little bit of a chicken and egg, because how am I going to get the computer to do it unless the computer knows how to do it? So you need humans to provide you with some training data to say, here's an image, and here's the text I found. Here's the image, here's the text I found. So you will see people, computer scientists, even social scientists, doing their research on the Mechanical Turk, promising to pay you five cents if you take uh, the image that's there and type whatever text is in there right, and input it. Um, it's an easy way to do sort of crowdsourcing. There's a whole lot of known things about who, the kinds of people who are actually going to be submitting for these tasks and what they're good at or not good at and what that might mean. Um, but anyway, this is a kind of framework, and this is exactly what, um, uh, uh, right? So here's, here's another, here's an example. Like the, the task is, um, you know, does this, does this, um, uh, do, do you find this person in this article, and you scan through the article, and you say yes or no? Um, and in the case of in the case of the happiness index, what they did was they um, took the ten thousand words um, and had about ten thousand people um, read uh, some 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 number of those words, and then score them on a scale of one to ten, depending upon how happy they are. You usually have the same word done a number of times by different people, and then you get the average happiness for that word. Um, and then they're also giving you the, the standard deviation, which is sort of the spread around that, around that average. OK? Is that clear what we had? Right? We have a set of 10,000 words that came from the top 5,000 words in these sources. Um, we then just blast them onto the Mechanical Turk and say, I'm going to give you two cents or three cents if you spend a moment with me and, and, uh, and take some number of words and score them on, happy, on the happiness scale. Um, and that gave us these averages. OK? Yeah? So people just, a bunch of people just scored the word not, and then they took the average. Yeah. Not. Right. Um, and, in, and then if you look at. Um, in that, so not has a mean of 3.86, but a standard deviation of 1.29, right? So there's some spread around that as well, right? So do you have, I guess maybe it's like 10 numbers or something, like 10 people scoring the word not. Um, and then you just take the average, and you can also measure how, how spread it is. Is there a question? Right. So if you have if you have ten thousand words and you want to do all possible pairs, right? That's ten thousand times nine thousand nine hundred ninety-nine, right? So that you know you start to get 
I mean, if you, if you depend, if the order is important, right? So it gets to be computationally yucky after a while. And maybe given that this is, is such a simple-minded scheme, maybe it's not worth putting the effort, the effort into it, really. OK. Um, all right, so is it clear what we did, though, or what they did? We actually did this for um, uh, every word in, Ham er, in Shakespeare for another project we, um, and scored them based on uh, the, the four humors. Um, anyway, it works reasonably well. Um, OK, so you can read the text in, um, and then you can have a, a look at the, the top of the file. You do head, remember, gives you the top six things. And if you say, you give it the argument n equal 100, it'll give you the top 100 things. Um, and you can ask for the tail, um, that is the lowest scoring words. And you can see which words are the lowest scoring and all of that, um, and decide um, uh, uh, you know, if, if this thing seems to, if that, if the things that are happy and 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 not so happy seem to line up and make sense, um, so also then you could look at um, there are five thousand words that were taken from the New York Times, five thousand words that were taken from a lyrics database, five thousand words that were taken from Google Books, and five thousand words from Twitter. Um, but in the end, you have ten thousand words. So there's going to be some some things that don't match up. Right? There are going to be some words that appear in the Lyrics database that don't appear in the New York Times, or some words that appear in the New York Times and don't appear in Google Books, right? because there's only 5,000 of them in each category. So you could ask about, about that. Right? Um, uh, so, so for example, you could do a table. Um, if, you look at the, if you looked at the data, you'll see, um, the, let's say, the Twitter rank or the Google rank. So um, the word laughter, for example, in the, in the selection of, of, of Google Books and the selection of New York Times articles, the word laughter is, doesn't, isn't one of the top 5,000 words. But it is used quite often in Twitter, and it was used quite often in the Lyrics database. Right? So more people writing about laughing than, than, than the Times would. Um, that's happened a few times here. And so what you can do is you can look and see you know, when are there, when are things in some databases and not in others? Um, so, yeah. Um, I think they kept LOL in, we can ask. Um, and it wouldn't be, it wouldn't count as laughing, it's just literally the word laughing. So LOL would be its own word. Um, so, you know, here's a, uh, there's some words, for example, that occur, um, Here's a word that occurs only in the Twitter top 5,000, millionaire. Um, but it's not in the, in the top 5,000 for, the for the other sources. So you could start to ask, how different are these, how different are these, um, uh, how different are these sources? So you can do a table, and you can say, um, let's look at, um, uh, uh, we saw this in our homework. There's a, a function called is.na which means basically true if it's missing, if it's an NA, and false otherwise. So we can make a table of is.na happy lyrics rank against is.na happy NYT rank. And what that'll do is it'll give you true false against true false, the rows referring to whether or not it's, um, it's missing in the lyrics, and the columns being whether or not it's missing in the New York Times. And you can start to see, you know, is there, do the two, do the two have any agreement or not? Um, and let's see. So, um, so here we see um, if we look at um, uh, if it's if it's missing. In the lyrics database, it's true. If it's if it's not missing, it's false. That means it's it's one of the top five thousand. And then in the columns, you have true and false for whether or not it's missing in the New York Times. And you see that the two don't really have much to do with each other. They're about the same number in each category. Okay, um, as opposed to let's say if you compare um, the Twitter Twitter data and the lyrics, you see that the diagonals are bigger, which means that there's that you tend to see the same words more often, both in the lyrics database and in, on Twitter, um, than you would say seeing them together um, in the New York Times or the, uh, the than in the New York Times. Right. So this is basically just telling us something about about the um, 
uh, about the, the kinds of words that we have and, and, and what each different source brings. Um, with tables, we've been looking at them with mosaic plots. So here, for example, is the plot of that first table, which is comparing the New York Times to the Lyrics database. And you sort of see kind of more or less evenly shaped blocks. If you compare it instead to, um, to, the, to Twitter and the Lyric ranks, you see that there's more sort of the things on the diagonal are bigger, which means they, they're agreeing with each other more. Things that are in the Lyric database tend to also be in the Twitter database and vice versa. Um, we can also have a look at the happy scores um, just to see what they look like. Um, it's numeric, so we want to summarize that with a, with a, with a, uh, uh, a histogram. Um, and again, the, the, the one thing we can play with a histogram is the number of breaks. Um, what, what, what can you tell me about this distribution? Or what's, it, what's interesting here or not? So, is it clear? so we're looking here at a summary of the 10,000 happiness scores. Um, is there something I can put in here that might help interpret this? Remember, the scores go from 1 to 10. Right. Yeah. So we can put a line at 5. And maybe color it something bright and make it really wide. So what do we see? Right, there's a lot more words that are sort of above neutral. What else? We had talked before about about That's right. So because the whole thing is shifted above five, where five is the neutral point, like the is a five, right? Um, so there tend to be more of that. Um, Also, is the shape the same, the left and the right? No, so it's not symmetric, right? It's a little more, it's a little more shoots up on one side and a more graceful on the other side. We'll have a look at what might, what might be causing that in a second. OK. Um, we can also um, uh, maybe compare scores of words that were inside the New York Times. There are 5,000 words that scored in the top five, right? So you have the top 5,000 New York Times words, and then there's 5,222 that weren't among the, the New York Times top scores. Um, and, uh, uh, and we can have a look at those. Um, and those I'm just going to sort of jump over here for. This is, uh, this is the histogram of. Um, words that were used in the New York Times, they're in that top 5,000. And then this is the histogram of the ones that weren't in the New York Times. So we'll just toggle between those two. What do you see? In, not. In, not. What's the interesting thing about the not distribution? Pardon? They're more positive, true. Um, but if you sort of stare at it, you see that there's like two pieces, right? There's a sharp piece around five, right? That's that vertical line. So there's a sharp piece around five. Um, and then there's a, another bump that's happening between, let's say, five and six and a half, or five and a half and six and a half. Does everybody see that or no? Yes, no? Yeah? OK. So what you could do is then have a look and see what's going on with that, why there might be. Anytime you see stuff like that, I know this is a little bit of fishing, but anytime you see a distribution that has a couple of bumps in it, you should ask yourself, why, why is that happening? That usually means there's two types of things that are getting mixed together, and your job is to figure out what makes them different. OK? Um, and so if you have a look, maybe. Um, uh, so let's, um, let's look at uh, the subset, just those, those uh, words that are, um, that are missing from the New York Times. And then let's look at the words that are between, let's say, four and three quarters and five and a half. 
Um, that's the words that are coming from, if I looked here, that's the words that are coming from this peak right here, between 4 and 3 quarters and 5 and a half right here. And we see there are words like, whoops. What do we what do we think of these of these as a list of stuff? Are many of them words? These are things that again that didn't appear in the New York Times, and they're coming from that that central spike around five. Do some of these look like words, or do many of them not look like words? How about that? Right? Because it's like C O, Q U, H M, K A, D1, D T, right? These are little guys, right? Um, that, that don't really look like actually anything. Um, but if instead you looked at um, the words that came from um, that came from the uh, um, that came from the other. So these are the words that came from that wider hump. And what do we see here? These tend to be real words, but words that just aren't used all that often, like molecules and um, uh, 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 well, probability, unfortunately, and, and so on. So, so these, are, these are real words, but like manufacture occupation, words that don't, that don't get as much, um, as much usage. Right? So if we're thinking about what's causing the kind of jump here, what's happening, the spike around 5 is happening because there's a whole lot of junky words that aren't really words. And when you give them to people to score, it says, if you don't know what to do, give it a 5. Right? If it somehow has no information in it whatsoever, you give it a 5. And so you get a whole lot of little junky words that are contributing to the spike at 5. And then the other piece, the rest of it, is words that just don't happen all that often. but. Um, uh, uh, but you know they can make some express some sentiment about them. So they don't happen all that often. So they're left out of the New York Times top 5,000, um, but they're sort of real words. Right? So um, anyway, the the point is that you get anytime you see two groups, and this is maybe a a bad thing to try to hang that on. But anytime you see two groups, you should ask yourself why, what's causing them, why why do those two conditions exist? Um, and this also then comes to what what you know when we're thinking when we were thinking last time about like mean and median and all of that sort of stuff. Um, when you're given a distribution like this, it's probably better to talk about its shape, to talk about you know, what's going on. Like there's, you know, there's a, there are two classes of things, two classes of words, for example, that are left out of the times, the junky words and then the, the sort of real bigger ones. And so something like that is a, is a better way to describe it than just to say there's an, the average is 5.2 or whatever it might be right? in terms of synthesizing or talking about the, the distribution. OK, so that's half the story, right? So we have this table of words. And then the way we, 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 we sc we're technically scoring tweets is by looking at all the words in the tweets, finding which words are, live in our among our 10,000. If they live among the 10,000, give them a number and take the average of those numbers. OK? Um, all right, so what we need next then to make this kind of go is that we need to access Twitter. And we need to be able to use Twitter as a kind of service. Um, so. Uh, you could, um, in the next few slides, very quickly become a developer. It doesn't really take very much. <laughs> um, uh, so if you go to dev.twitter.com, um, you can, uh, uh, at the bottom there, it says, get started with the platform. Um, and you can start to, um, we can start to work with um, pulling data from Twitter as a, as a kind of research source. Um, the documentation allows you to describe stuff that you could pull about tweets, about individual users, um, about places. Right? All of those are sort of describable via Twitter service. Um, and what we're going to focus on is just the tweets and do searches for, for um, particular topics. Um, and we're going to use, uh, if you click through um, and have a look at their API, which is, stands for Application Programming Interface, they have a series of services that they offer. Um, and again, this is we talked about this on the first day. This is the idea that um, that uh, data is no longer a kind of fixed thing, but that it might be a live service that you subscribe to. That data are sort of constantly coming at you, like volume of, of tweets, um, and that you could subscribe to a service. 
um, you could take the data from that service, process it in some way, and maybe republish it as part of an application or part of a service that you're creating. Um, and that idea of data moving from one thing to another is a very Web 2.0 idea, right? The idea that you can mash up or combine different services. So the idea of data as a service or software as a service is something that, that, um, that is coming up here. And so we're using, again, an API, or we're calling Twitter's APIs, um, uh, which, which abstracts um, methods for pulling data out of Twitter. Um, there's a whole lot of terms on this page, like REST and so on, that we don't have time to really go through, but we'll, um, we'll at least show you how to get started. Um, so among all the API stuff that you could look at, we're going to look at um, a searching for tweets. Um, and um, in particular, um, you'll see toward the, the middle of the page, there's the resource URL, https api.twitter.com slash 1.1 uh, slash search slash tweets .json. and then after that you give it a series of things, the, the stuff that you're searching for, that um, what you're doing to specify getting data from Twitter is really just specifying uh, a URL like you would for a web page. But now instead of that thing giving you a web page, it gives you back data. Okay. Um, and you can have a, a look at it um, with um, uh, the uh, 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 Twitter has offers you a, a, a console. Um, so dev.twitter.com slash console allows you to, to try out the API, um, to make queries, and to see what things would come back so you can sort of get your code ready. Um, and uh, in this case, we, I, from these options, um, I just selected the, the tweets search. Um, and uh, this gives you a, a particular search. And then you can start to type in um, phrases. Um, actually, you can get started. If you, go to, if you, if you navigate over to dev.twitter.com slash console, if we can open up a browser and give that a go. Um, and then from, from the URLs, like from the list of services, pick the search. So you can scroll down this list here, and you'll see a search. Um, that will leave you with this page. Um, and you can now start to input um, input variables in the in the bottom that will restrict will, will will tell Twitter what kind of data you're interested in. So Q represents the query. What kind of terms do I want to get back? Um, maybe I want to look for pound sign CUJ14. Um, I gave searches for joy and evil because I sort of wanted <laughs> sort of not so happy tweets and happy tweets. Um, uh, and so you can type in the, 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 in, the, in the value of the query box, you can type in a query you're interested in, hit send. Um, and when you do that, it's gonna ask, um, it's gonna ask to authenticate you. Um, and it's basically gonna ask you to sign into Twitter. Um, and this is a process, we've all done this before, right? We've authenticated via Facebook or we've authenticated via Twitter, right? Um, what's happening here, and we'll come back to the specifics in a second, um, is uh, the application, in this case the console, is um, taking its credentials along with your sign-in information and, and um, uh, uh, verifying you. But it's done in a way that it doesn't actually hold on to your information at all, okay? So it's, it's done in a kind of pass-through way. Um, and if you do that, um, I had sort of asked for, um, uh, uh, in the query box, I asked for evil, because like I said, I was going to look for evil and joyful tweets. Um, you, get, you get back on the right-hand side what Twitter would return for you. Um, and again, this is the same thing that you would have gotten by simply taking the um, URL that's being formed up, uh, up the request URL there in the middle of the page, taking that and posting it into a browser, you would have gotten some data back rather than an HTML page. Um, and this is just showing you what that data looks like. Um, the data are in JSON format. I think we talked about this the first day, meaning it's a slightly specialized format that deals in name value pairs. So there's a name in quotes, colon, then a value. Um, and there's some nice tools in R to read that kind of data. Um, th this is the, the authentication thing we're using, um, um, which we'll, I guess, come back to in a second. Um, if you wanted to, uh, for the, the purpose of the next piece of the assignment, that is from R, start to pull tweets, um, you're going to want to register yourself or register yourself as having an application. Um, and you can do that by going to dev.twitter.com slash apps. 
Um, and you can, uh, once you log into Twitter, you can create a new application. Um, it'll ask you for things like the name of the application, some description, a website. I just use journalism. Um, journalism.columbia.edu. Um, the name of my application was my experiment. Um, the description is I'm testing the API for class. Um, you hit go. Well, actually, there's a captcha. You hit go, and then you have um, then you have a, uh, uh, a new app. And with that new app, um, you're given a set of credentials that you can use to act like the verify with Facebook apps that people people uh, write. Right? It's, it's, a, it's providing you with the credentials to be able to um, authenticate um, uh, with, with, in this case, with Twitter. Um, uh, the two pieces of information you're going to need are the consumer key and the consumer, consumer secret. And we can talk about that more in general. But the consumer secret you're supposed to keep secret, which is why it's all blacked out in red or redded out in red. Um, so uh, if you were to do this from within R, after having gone through and um, Sort of this page we don't need to do tonight, but you can do in the comfort of your own home. Um, after having gone through and um, created an, uh, uh, cre is it no, we're not comfortable at home, or no, there's no chance in hell we're going to do it at home, or? <laughs> yes, there we go. So once you've created an application, you're going to get these two strings, the consumer key and the consumer secret. and. Um, there's a package in R called Twitter, T-W-I-T-T-E capital R. Uh -huh, we've gotten a lot of mileage out of the capital R. Um, uh, after loading that package, you can uh, get some, you can authenticate to Twitter with this get Twitter OAuth, where the Ys and the Xs are your consumer key and the secret key, um, just copied from this web page here. Um, and then once you do that, you can now execute searches uh, on Twitter. So here I search Twitter for the word evil and search Twitter for the word joy. But really, all I've done is one, authenticate, and two, execute some searches. Right? It's, not, it's not a sort of complicated, it's not a complicated thing. Getting the signing up to Twitter, this actually is a fairly easy process. You're just led through filling in a couple of forms and hitting go. And then all you have to do is take this consumer key and consumer secret and stuff them up there in place of the Y and the Xs. And away you go. Um, it's going to want you to, 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 to grab that line and put it into a browser. But in the end, you're, you authenticate. Um, and so here, um, I've, I've pulled two uh, searches, one for evil and one for joy. and then. Um, t the library Twitter has, or package Twitter has, two a function called uh, the Twitter list to a D DF to a data frame. So I can take all of my tweets and turn them into a data frame, um, and that's what we have here. So if you source, so skipping a page of material, <laughs> um, if you source compute cj.org dm slash twitter data dot r, because um, I've stored the joy and the evil tweets I did this morning. Um, and you can grab them by, by just sourcing that, if you'd like. Um, source. So skipping all of that for the moment, um, you just source this guy. Um, and then. What you should see is that we now have two extra data sets. We have evil, um, which has the text. These are a series of tweets. Um, so the first column is just a series of tweets. And then it has a series of variables measured on each of those tweets, like um, if it had been favorited or not, um, the number of times it had been favorited, um, uh, uh, the date that it was created, whether or not it was truncated, that is, if somebody didn't do it for 140 characters, is it in reply to another tweet, um, is it in reply to a particular user, um, where, did the, where did the tweet come from? So in this case, it's coming from Twitter for iPhone, um, many of them. Some of them coming from BlackBerry, Android, um, TweetBot for iOS, etc. So you can see where it came from. Um, and then um, you can see the screen name of the person who tweeted it, um, the retweet count. Um, 
So uh, yeah, there's some few of these that have been tweeted like retweeted, retweeted like crazy. Um, and then the longitude and latitude. That's sort of if there was geotagged. And what you'll see is that there's a whole lot of missing values for those geotags because most of the time people don't don't stamp tweets. In fact, I think there's only like 10 of them in this data set. Here they are. Um, so there could be longitude and latitude as well. Yes? Uh, how is it interpreted so a hashtag keeps it? It keeps it as a hashtag. It's, 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 you know, some words are the only words you want. Right. Oh, you mean for the happiness score? In general. Or for in general. Yeah, it's just, it's just a string. It's just what it is. Yeah? No, so uh, so if you go, I, I installed a package, um, so it should be down here. Um, oh, we didn't install it. So you can install dot packages, um, t w i t t e r. Oops, um, and it'll install a bunch of stuff that will let you um, grab data from Twitter, um, and then you just load it. So install packages and then give it Twitter here, T-W-I-T-T -T and then capital, or lowercase e and then a capital R. Um, and then that's the thing that's going to allow you to, um, to do all of, right? That has the, the, that has the function get Twitter OAuth that allows you to authenticate with Twitter and it allows you to execute searches. Um, there's a special function to just pull tweets about R if you get so in, in, uh, involved. Um, and then, anyway, up up until uh, so, so all of this is what we had to do to um, take the data from Twitter. Here we're asking for 500 tweets in the English language that contain the word "evil" and 500 tweets in the English language that contain "joy." I thought I would contrast the two, um, and then I converted I converted the results that came from Twitter. Um, these are just sort of Twitter data. I converted them into a data frame called "evil and joy." Um, I sort of cleaned up the encoding because um, the text part of a tweet, uh, depending upon the keyboard you're using or the shortcuts you're using, you could put smiley faces, hearts, you know, a whole lot of characters that R doesn't know what to do with. So here we're converting um, the text from from general sort of uh, uh, in, into into ASCII, into into a, a very refined um, character set um, that R can play with. Um, so if you bypass all that, instead what you can do is simply take the data that I did this morning. So I did these steps this morning. Um, and um, this, is the, this is the data that I got. And you'll see that you have two, two new objects, joy and evil. And again, they're just data frames that contain Twitter data. The first field is just the tweets. The second field has to do with favorited and eventually longitude and latitude. OK? So you can see. Again, these are just 500 sort of tweets that came in order um, that contain the search that the search term we're looking for, right? Um, out of curiosity, uh, so there's a lot of stuff in these data um, aside from the text itself. So before we get there, tell me something about the data that we've pulled. Like, tell me something. Either take joy or evil, and tell me something about it. Like. Are there, is there anything you would expect to see in terms of how tweets are favorited or retweeted? Is there anything you expect to see about, um, about the source, like where things are coming from? D tell, tell me something about, tell me something, take like two or three minutes and tell me something about the data. Skipping the text field for the moment, we'll come back to that. Is that? It's a pretty open ended. So for example, what fraction of these tweets were retweeted? Um, what's the mo of these 500, what's the most popular platform that people tweet from?
find something, throw your hand up. <laughs> so I'll ask something simple. How, what fraction were retweeted? How would we get that? From the Joy data set, what fraction were retweeted? Pardon? Right, so in the retweet column, it, the retweeted are the ones that have true. So how many tweets were retweeted? Okay, first of all, how do I pull just the retweet data? How do I pull just that column? Hmm? What? The okay, good. Joy dollar sign. Um, actually, in this case, the variable we want is retweeted, right? So there's a bunch of retweeteds. How do I figure out how many of those are, are true? Some. Oh, that's too bad. <laughs> so none of them were retweeted. Okay? Because remember, logicals, when you when they are asked to perform like numbers, true goes to one, false goes to zero. So if I sum all those up, I'll get I'll get a one every time there was a true, which means it was retweeted. What about in evil? How many retweets were there? What do we have to replace? There we go. And again, zero. Um, so maybe that's not such a good question. A lot of things don't get retweeted. What if we ask about that whether or not the individual tweet was a retweet itself? How many of those do we have in evil? One eighty two? One eighty two, very good. So hundred and eighty two of the five hundred tweets were retweets themselves. Okay? In in evil and in joy. It was a little bit less. Okay? Is it clear what we're doing or no? Okay. Um so um what was the what was the average retweet count for that particular tweet? In other words, many of them have been retweeted. Like this one, it is retweeted. This one is retweeted. And everywhere it is retweeted, there's the number of times it had been retweeted total. So what's the average number of retweet counts? How do we find that? Excellent. Oh, it's quite large, right? Um, what does that mean that the average is 59? Right, but I mean, that's a big number, right? Everything we're looking at here is 0, 1s, and 2s. Ah, here's a big number. Do you, see, do you see what's happening? Let's have a look. So we see one tweet that's got like a huge number of retweets, and then a lot of them are really small. Um, and in fact, yeah, and a lot of them are small. So we see that of the 500, 364 weren't retweeted at all. One were 55 times, two was 18, 12, and it's sort of decreasing. And then, um, and then it gets out to like one, one tweet that was retweeted 14,000 times, 15,000 times. 
Okay, so when I took the average, mean, I got 60 because I took a whole lot of zeros and I averaged it with a 15,000, right? So in this case, the average isn't a good summary of those numbers. Is that clear? Right? Because the numbers are all kind of small, 0, 1s, and 2s, most of them. And then, shoom, there's a 14, or 15,000. Right? So the average isn't really a good representation of that data. So I wouldn't say that, on average, you know, tweets are retweeted 60 times. Right? That's not quite the right thing. And this is where the median and the mode are going to be very different. Um, so the median is 0. Right, which means half of them are, are zero. Well, I guess we could have seen that without having to compute it, right? But um, okay. So if I was summarizing something, an average here isn't such a good idea, right? There's a heavily skewed distribution, right? What else can you tell me about about um, about these fields without getting into the text? What can you tell me about the, the, the uh, source? What's the most popular platform people tweeted from? Pardon? Um, Twitter for iPhone, Twitter for Blackberry, which one? How would we figure that out here? What takes the column of data and, and pairs with each unique thing the count? Table, right? So I can do table of joy dollar status source. Um, so I see some numbers here. And maybe what I want to do is sort that so I get the biggest at the bottom. And I see that, in this case, the Twitter for iPhone has got 171. People tweeting off the web is 121. Uh, Twitter for Android is 71. Twitter for BlackBerry is 30. Right? So we can see which platforms are popular. Right? And all we did there was we created, um, first we created a table of the status source. And that table gives you the label and then the number of times that label appeared, and then sorting it orders the entries so that we have the biggest at the bottom and the smallest at the top. OK? Yeah? If you wanted to organize that graph with a graph or a bar chart, and then just have it say, like, iPhone or something, could you, could you like, pick out um, just like iPhone? Just yeah. So this is the bar plot. So you get very quickly just ones. And then you have this. And then we could label it as, as you like. Um, well, well, we can tidy up the labels afterwards. But you see that it's iPhone, then, um, then the web, then Android, and so on. OK? Is there anything else? Yeah. Yeah, so all I did was this. So. So table gives you it just in alphabetical order of the labels, right? And these labels are a little funny. They're all they're all uh, tags, right? These are thing I guess things that people click through to get to the thing. So these are done in terms of tags. Um, so they're a little complicated looking, um, but these are the labels and then the count. And so if I just do table by itself, I get them ordered um, alphabetically. So you're going to get a whole lot of the A's first, and then the w web the w and if i want to sort it by the count um, i just i just do a sort and that sorts the table by their entries and, and the sort and so it's sort tabled right yeah you could do it by date and time also absolutely and, uh, yeah so the lubridate package that we used for our I like that. Yeah, that, that will allow you to specify the dates and times using this very simple formula. Yeah. yeah. It, uh, it, you have, so if you get factors, you have to do an as.char. That's like the cruddy. There's some things that you have to do when you're teaching this stuff, and you go, oh, that's not very pretty. Like if I, if I were making the world, there would be little tiny, little tiny things that, of course, if I were making the world, it would be a horrible. But anyway, it's a whole other. All right. What, anything else someone wants to tell me about 
about these points. We don't have very many lat longs, but can we put them on a map? Maybe. Um, we didn't talk about it, but there's a, there's a, we were using something called map tools, um, but there's also just plain old maps in R, so you can install that package as maps. Um, and then go down. here, and then you can just do um, map by itself will give you the world. Of course, a slightly small, irritating version of the world. That's really awful. Um, we can do USA instead. Oh, really? Small, irritating version of the USA. And you can do points of joy, dollar longitude, joy, dollar latitude. Um, it's shockingly small and irritating. Um, maybe we color them. Anyway, so roughly from the population centers, like I said, there's only, uh, I think, 15 tweets out of the 500 that have geotags attached to them, so it's not a huge number. You'd have to be watching for a long time to start to see, to see patterns that way. OK, uh, was there anything else we should say before we, did we see multiple, how about this, did we see anybody tweet more than one time in this 500, this group of 500? How would we get that? So we could, we could do basically what we did for, um, for the status source. We could do screen name. There's the table, and we could sort it. And we'll see that um, sample of joy, joy, a frosty joy, those were all doing multiple times. OK. Did anyone else find anything else with that? Yep. For the map? Um, so, so there's a, a kind of simple, so this, um, I don't quite know why it's behaving so badly with this, uh, with this plotting region. Um, there's a, a function called uh, maps, oops, map, um, and it takes things like uh, USA or USA and county, oh sorry, I think it just wants county here. Sorry, uh, counties, so you get all the counties listed out. Again, irritatingly small. Um, or you could just do states. So it's a simple map tools. What map tools allows you to do is to take arbitrary shapes that you might find on the web. So whether it's precincts in New York City or the river system or what have you, right? any kind of geometry and be able to plot. Maps has some built-in things, countries of the world, United States, the individual states and counties are sort of at least in that library and made sort of easy. Um, the problem is if you try to zoom in, although I'm not quite sure why it's doing things so slow, we probably have to close down our studio and open it back up again. But the problem with, with this particular data set is it's meant to be registered at a kind of global scale. It doesn't look so good if you get really close. And like if you get really close, New York is like five points and you know, Manhattan is like five points joined together. It's very tiny um, or very coarse as opposed to the precinct database that we were looking at before, which is much more refined. Okay, so this is meant to just be a coarse overview of something. Yes? Um, I was wondering if the maps feature also maps by other countries. Yeah, so you can do the whole, uh, you can do, it's, it's, a, it's a little, um, if you do map the whole thing, you get the world, but you can focus on in individual countries, and it's a little, um, it's a little idiosyncratic. I think you can get marked out all the provinces in China, for example. Like, it depends on who's paying attention and contributes stuff to the map library, right? So it's, it's a little bit idiosyncratic. Um, all right, so what we can do then to try to get closer to, um, to the text um, is we can, um, 
Uh, let's say we take the first tweet. So we'll take joy from the text uh, variable. We'll take just the first entry. And that gives us the tweet, no classes on Friday all semester, tears of joy, um, which is, again, a very complicated one, right? Because tears is going to be scoring very low, and joy is going to be scoring quite high. Um, but what we can do is, is to, to be able to match up to our, our word database. So again, the algorithm we need to do here is to say, take all of those words and find them in the database. Okay, so what are the tasks that I have to do to be able to find them in the database? What do I have to do to this tweet to make it something that I can just look up? Yeah? Okay, I can, in other words, okay, so but in what you said though, associate each word, I first need to find the words here, right? Okay? Right, but this is a string. Of the, I need to make a vector of them, right? Right now it's one whole vector, or it's like one whole character string. No class on Fridays, all semester, tears of joy. It's one long thing. And what I'd like to do is break it up so that each word is a separate element. I can, sep I can, uh, I can split on commas. I can also split on spaces, right? So one thing I, well, actually, even before I get there, one thing I might want to do is, um, is take the tweet and remove all the case from it, right? Because our, our database of words had everything lowercase, OK? Friday, Monday, Tuesday, Bloomberg, it's all lowercase, OK? Um, so the first thing we did is this, a command called to lower, which takes case and makes it all lower. Any guess on what to upper would do? Right, OK, good. And uh, headings, any idea what that would do? Heading, it would make just the first lever thing a capital. Anyway, so we turn them all small. Um, and then we could do, um, uh, the next thing is maybe removing the punctuation. Oh, gosh, I keep typing in the wrong place. And so here what we've done is we've removed all the punctuation. Um, we've used a function called gsub. And what gsub is doing is, is, is saying replace the, f the stuff the, fir the stuff before the first comma with the stuff after the second comma and do it for the object tweet. Okay, now, the stuff before the first comma, the bracket, bracket, colon, punct, is a character class specifying punctuation. If you do help on gsub, you'll see that there are various classes that R defines. Letters, numbers, um, control characters, um, uh, punctuation. So you can make substitutions to, to punctuation. Um, and this is a particular example of something called a, which we certainly don't have time to do in our little three hours together, but there is an entire uh, framework or language for specifying patterns in text. They're called regular expressions, and it's a way to, to define a pattern of um, uh, patterns in text like removing punctuation, or getting rid of the word no, or getting rid of, of, um, of repeated words, or something like that. Yes? Sir, can you just help me along with the gsub? Right. So what gsub does, like the right. So what gsub is supposed to be doing is taking a pattern um, here, a pattern, and then, and then um, offering a replacement for that pattern. Um, and then, so here's, here it is. So you give me some data x. In this case, it's the tweet. You specify for me a pattern, and you tell me what I should replace that pattern with. So in this case, the pattern is punctuation. right? This is a character class that refers to punctuation. And I'm replacing it with just double quote, double quote, which means nothing, empty, make it go away. And I've changed my tweet from um, no class on Fridays, period, all semester, period, tears of joy, period, to just all flowing together. Yes? Um, that's the way you write it in this logic. Um, yeah, so this is, a, this is a particular, we should have some. Pardon? No, no, no. There's, um, there should be. Um, There should be a specification here of the, of the character classes. So here we have 
um, alphanumeric, alpha, blank, um, uh, uh, graphical characters like hearts and whatever, punctuation, space, digits, right? So um, it's a, it's this language is a way of specifying different aspects of the uh, of text, um, and these character classes are just one part of it. Um, regular expressions let you let you define really rich a, a really rich language around extracting pieces from text. Um, in this case, all we're doing is just removing the punctuation. And I show you this just because it gives you a sense of, of there's a language and there's a regularity to do this, right? So we take the tweets, we make them lowercase, we remove the punctuation, and then maybe the next thing we can do is split the string with spaces. Um, and that should give us words. And so here we have the individual words, no class on Fridays, all semester, tears of joy. Right, so we split by spaces, and that's given us the words. Um, and then, um, so then we can say, all right, which words are in that in our in our word list? So happy dollar word. That's that's the column of ten thousand two hundred and twenty-two words. And we're saying which of our words here, the no classes on Fridays, which of those words are in that vector? And it says that no and classes and on and Fridays and all semester, um, uh, tears of joy, those are all in there. Okay. Um, and then we can turn it around if we wanted to. And we could say, let's look at, um, let's turn it around and say, give me just the words. Um, so, so subset for me, um, take take all the 10,000 words and say which one are in our vector of words that represents our tweets. And that'll give us 10,222 trues and falses. True if that word is in our tweet and false if it isn't. And then we can use that as a subset, because remember we can subset with logical stuff, to say happy dollar word, for just keep those words that where that was true. And that gives you joy Fridays all classes on semester. And you can then extract to compute the um, the values, you could say, instead of happy dollar word, you could, you could look at the actual scores. So happy, happiness, underscore average. And it tells you that, um, uh, uh, that uh, the scores are 8, 7, 6, 5, and so on. Does uh, Yes. So T word. Uh, 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 so T words, yeah, I tried to skip over that. T words is a uh, this object back here. T words when 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 you split something, this is another place where it's not so pretty. T words is is an object called a list, and I'm just taking the first object, which is so. If I look at T words, you see that it's it's got this bracket one. If I did a, if I did um, if I instead of splitting um, one tweet, I split um, evil uh, dollar text one to three. Um, what I'd see is um, the three tweets one, two, and three with all the words inside. Okay, and so what I'm doing this square bracket one just says give me the first one. Square bracket two would give me the second. The double square bracket three would give you the third. It's a it's a third data type. It's called the list. I just didn't want to. I thought we'd gone so far with columns and data frames. I didn't want to like unspool the whole thing for you. But anyway, there there. Yeah. So so then finally, what you can do is is take the mean score and it's five point four, right? So so that's that's a that's the the. Um, that's a, 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 you could say, well, OK. Um, so one thing we might want to do then um, is extend the R language to allow us to do that a lot of times. Um, so what I might do, and at this point I'm just introducing you to some of the concepts. This, I'm not expecting that we'll actually write functions. But, but we've been dealing in functions, bar plot, plot. Um, read.csv, mean, median, right? You can write your own functions in R as well if there's stuff that you're going to find yourself doing a lot. So, for example, this scoring of tweets, um, 
uh, I can write a function that takes two arguments, tweets, comma, then the happy score. So I'll give it a, a vector of tweets, and I'll give it our data frame that says the words and, and their happiness scores. Um, and then I basically go through and do what we just did. I break the tweets up along spaces. Um, I uh, initialize the scores according to how many, how many tweets I'm applying this to. And then I iterate, in this case, for, for i, an index i, um, running through 1 to the length of broken. So for each of the, each of the, the things that we've created, each of the tweets that we have, we're going to turn it to lower, we're going to substitute the punctuation, and we're going to take the mean of the happiness scores for the stuff that's in there. Um, and that's, that we're going to store that, and then we're going to return it. And so this whole thing defines for us a function. Um, and if we, if we execute it, um, we see that now uh, we have an object over here. Oops. We'll see that we have um, an object here called score tweets. It's in our, in our functions. And so now we have something that we've made, a new function that we've made ourselves. Um, and we can go ahead and run it if we wanted to. Um, score tweets uh, to, to, let's say, uh, score all the text, all the tweets in the evil uh, data frame. And that's all of them, right? The, all 500. So, We've taken a set of steps that we've wanted to do. Take the text, turn it to lowercase, um, uh, remove all the punctuation, split it by spaces, and then, and then look those words up in the, in, the, in the data set to figure out what their average score is, and then average that up. We've, we've taken that functionality. We've put it into a new function, a new thing, and that's all it does. And now we can repeat that as many times as we like, or we can send it to a friend, or you know, whatever, send it home, say, look what I made today, put it up on the refrigerator. It's awesome. Um, all right. So, and then finally, what we could do is, um, is maybe add those scores to our evil data set. So instead of having the data end with latitude and longitude, we can now have it um, end with scores, which means we've added one last column to our data set called scores. Um, and then maybe we can, uh, uh, let's say, order order the data set um, according, to, um, according to scores. Uh, oh, it's evil, sorry. So now the, the data set's been uh, sorted according to scores. And so if you do tail on that, you'll see the ones that are the, the most evil. Um, which don't feel that evil. To me, oh no, this is the other way around. These are the happiest of the evil tweets, and the head of them are the the evilest of the evil tweets, which I guess not surprisingly is I'm evil, <laughs> and you lying evil so and so, they're evil so and so is an evil bastard, right? So anyway, you get the idea that it's in fact sort of doing as you might have hoped. <laughs> um, okay. All right, so. Um, so what we've done then is um, we've walked through a couple things so far. We've um, looked at the idea that we can pull data from Twitter at will, so we can do searches if we want and pull tweets. By, by the same token, we can use that mechanism to pull all the tweets that we've ever posted or all the tweets of all the people that we're following. We could pull them down into one place and process them if we want. We can search for, for the New York Times project we were working on. We were always searching for um, tweets uh, that, that were about a particular uh, news article. So we could see how many people were tweeting about particular articles. So something you published, for example, you can do a search in Twitter for the URL of that story and see how often that URL gets circulated um, and what people are saying about it. And inevitably, maybe try to score the sentiment. Are people thinking that it's righteous or not so righteous? Um, but maybe, hopefully, not with this technique. Um, OK. Um, and that was sorting the scores. All right. Um, were there questions about that? So yes. Okay. Uh huh.
Yeah. Right. Right. That's happening because um, if you looked, it's um, it's uh, uh, the words are in fact a factor, and the 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 levels are according to the order in which they've occurred. So there, it's it's doing that by it's doing it because it's a factor. Right, because the original data was sorted that way. Oh, actually, no, I take it back. It's not because it's a factor. Think about what you're doing in that expression. Sorry, that, sometimes I blah, 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 too much. So um, think about what it's, it's doing here. So it's, the, it's, that, it's the, the line 1, 2, 3, 4 for the bottom. You're saying, look at all the words, right, and tell me which ones are in my tweet, yeah. right? So I'm going to get now a, a column of trues and falses. The, the, the first true is going to be the first word in that 10,022 that's in my tweet. The second word is going to be the second word out of the 10,222 that are in that tweet. So they're, going to, they're being pulled out because of the order in which we're searching for them. We flipped it around. Instead of saying words in happy words, we're saying happy word in, in words. Right. So that happy word that happy word in words is giving me a vector of 10,222 trues and falses. True if the word is in the tweet and, and false if it's not. And the, so I'll get a pattern of trues and falses. And so when I subset by that, I'm pulling out, I'm pulling them out, but they're in order of the original words, the original happy words and not the tweet itself. Um, yeah, the table that that they pulled, right? So if you look, if you look at the um, if you look at the data in the data frame in the happy data, um, you'll see that um, right, and the happiest are at the top. Okay, but it's just like, okay. And so because we're taking <laughs> right, and because we're taking the ten thousand twenty two and asking which of those are in the tweet, they're being pulled out in the order they're originally sorted in. Okay. Does that make sense? It de all right, it all depends. So we could have sorted it on evilness now instead, or something else maybe. Oh, actually, we don't have enough for that. But we could have sorted it reverse. We could have mixed it up. Right. Does that make sense? How would you say that this process is used? How would I? How would the block of uh, trees not be sorted? I would use a function called match instead. This, this in thing is, is sort of a simple way to get around it. There's a function called match that makes it yeah. Right. So it looks. It appears that when you do a search on Twitter, it gives you not only the search in the tweet. That's right. But also the name, the login name. So I think you might be able to limit that. If we go back to the original, if you go back to the, um, to the to the 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 search page. Right, where you're able to um, specify a query, I think you might be able to limit it to be just the content of the tweet itself. I could, but I'll do it afterwards. I feel like I feel like there's three of you, and I'm going to lose everybody else if I don't. But yes, were there other questions? Okay, so. Um, So um, I thought what I'd do next is um, talk a little bit about sort of more refined ways of using text as data, um, and maybe give you a couple examples um, of where you might go next. Um, uh, because so far, what we've been doing in using text as data is simply using the symbol itself. Right? We've been using the fact that there's a string of characters. Those characters are different than this other string of characters. And we're looking it up in a table somewhere and then associating with a value that a group of random people said was a certain degree of happy. But we're not using the fact that laughter and laughing and laughs are all kind of the same, and that puppy is a small dog, and that it's a noun, whereas, whereas you know, laughing is a 
Jaren? Is a someone help me here? I'm the math guy. Jaren, right? So, um, so we're not using any of the grammatical structure of the text. So what I thought I'd do is give you some examples of places where you can use the grammatical structure, um, and these examples come from some of the a, a couple of things of the work I've done. We'll spend maybe ten minutes on this and maybe get out early. Um, so. Uh, the first example comes from the lobby of the New York Times building. Um, my collaborator and I were fortunate enough to be able to make the artwork there. Um, so how many of you have been? OK, we, we should go. We'll maybe do a little trip. I had promised you a trip to the R&D lab. We need to do that so you can at least see the, the creative technologists, because they're all using R. Um, so here's what, the, um, here's what the display looks like. Um, fortunately, the sound isn't seems completely shot. Um, so it's a series of 560 text displays, 280 on each wall. Um, the uh, it kind of goes in this. Well, it does several things, but it, one of the things it does is it goes in this radar pattern where it leaves behind chunks, and the chunks of text it leaves behind are are uh, uh, the, the 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 screen is a. Uh, holds a noun phrase, and that noun phrase, uh, those noun phrases highlighted in the cluster make that story different than all the other stories in the day's news. So it's sort of, you can walk by and sort of tell what's going on in the day's news that way. Um, the displays look something like this from the side. Um, here's another, we don't seem to have any sound, so that's super bad, but. Um, these are extremely chatty things, so, so the lack of sound is annoying. But um, So this is another scene where what we're doing is extracting the number item pairs from the day's paper. Um, there's a kind of going along with it, and there's a limit to how much animation I'm going to give you here. But um, uh, uh, there's a click that's going along with it. Um, so you can see the, the pattern here is a number and then some phrase. Yeah, so um, so it's kind of like the figures of the day's news. Yeah, it's from that day's news. Yeah, I think this it's open up to the last two or three days, but it's current. Um, and again, it's unfortunate we don't have any sound because it's a really noisy thing. Um, and the the way this. Um, the way this works is that we're extracting these number item pairs. Um, sometimes they're, they're written. So we had to go through the New York Times style guide about when things were written out and when they were numbers. Um, and basically what we're doing is, is putting a process on, on this stuff. So um, there's a fantastic piece of Java code from Stanford, a parser, that basically, I don't know if, if we do this anymore, did we diagram sentences in elementary school? Right? Did you? No? Maybe? Like you draw it out? Yeah? I, and at some point, that's going to go away, but maybe. Um, so this top one, each of these is a sentence. So you can see in the highlighted, four urban dwellers who have no backyards. The country's one million community gardens can also play an important role. Mrs. Obama, do we see the text? And the text is all padded now with references to, to parts of speech. So um, NP is noun phrase. Um, CD is for a, like a quantity. DT is a determiner, like and, the, what have you. So this is basically taking a sentence and writing a tree, like drawing it out as a tree. Um, and then to pull the number item pairs, we're extracting, so we've written filters for those trees. right? So we're looking for noun phrases that begin with, um, with, a, with a quantity. Um, uh, and, and it's in, at this stage then that you could start to get um, a lot more um, of the semantics, right? I mean, this is the semantics of the, of, or sorry, this is the grammar of the, of, the, of, the, of the sentences. And you can start to ask questions like, what are the noun phrases um, that are being discussed? What are the verb phrases? What are, you know, you can start to get a lot more text here. Yes? Yeah, so it makes mistakes. So this is welcome to computer processing. And so actually, I remember when I did this as a kid, I had a hit rate of about 
75% that I would get it right. Um, but this is good enough that um, if you look at sort of a, a particular screen, if the um, eight around it all look okay, right? So if something makes a mistake but the eight around it are, are fine, then you're willing to suspend disbelief and keep going, right? So we just have to have a certain hit rate that doesn't let that happen. No, I mean, here we're just looking at number item pairs. There's no definition. We just look at things that start with quantity. And then, and then there had to be some rules to take it out of the New York Times style, style guide. But that, that was something that was in the text. It was easy. Um, we had other uh, technique. This is, it just doesn't quite work without the sound. Um, in this case, the tragic piece is that it, um, uh, it's typing. So there's a sound of a typewriter. There's a speaker on the back of each one of these, so it's typing things out. Um, uh, we watched a, an intern in the studio type for a month, and so we got the timing of things right. So the T and H followed with a certain rate, and the A and the P followed with a certain rate. So it made it look like it was, it was typing and sound like it was typing. Um, so you could fill the room with 560 typewriters, in that case, typing the letters to the editor. Um, and then we had other scenes, let's say, related to like the crossword puzzles. We had every crossword puzzle that appeared in the paper. Um, and we get to, I'm not sure if I have the text of it, no. Um, and we get to go back and keep coding. So we get to put a, a folding table in the lobby of the building and then just work there for a month and add new stuff. And so the next, uh, the next piece we're adding is um, uh, we have a database of all the recipes that ever appeared in the New York Times. So if anyone has an idea about what to do with thousands and thousands of New York Times recipes on the wall. I'm more than happy to, to, to work with you, because so far, we haven't come up with anything totally awesome. I mean, we have some things like take all the recipes and make one big recipe out of it, right? So it's like you know, 100 pounds of flour and 200 pounds of butter and you know, 70,000 pitches of salt, and, but anyway. Um, the next piece I thought I'd show, this one doesn't have sound, thankfully, is um, uh, instead of being inside a building, it's outside of a building. So this is the University of Texas at Austin. Um, and it's a projection uh, onto, the, onto the communication building across from uh, 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 across the Cronkite Plaza. Um, so this is uh, the thing. Um, uh, so here's it running. Um, it's, the light's a little hard here. But this is a video taken from across the, the hall. The data here now are both current news. We get a, uh, a feed of, of text from, um, from the uh, uh, local cable stations, um, like the, the closed caption. And then we get um, all, of Cronkite's, um, uh, uh, all of Cronkite's transcripts from his. Uh, and, and then this is playing out one of Cronkite's um, uh, uh, evening news transcripts from the same day 20 years ago. And you can kind of see the windows, like people's offices, right? So this is a big, so these are broad shouldered, bright um, displays or projectors. Um, no, we, uh, I mean, I suppose ultimately it's arbitrary, but um, uh, we sort of did it to make it feel like the, the pacing right now plays with the, the the surface, like some things recede and some things advance. It's kind of an interesting effect. Um, this again, also like the Times piece, has has scenes, and so like I said, we have the, the closed caption from the um, from the local TV broadcast news. So we'll take the morning, afternoon, evening news, and then mine it for information. Here, for example, we're playing out just the questions that the broadcasters asked one another which makes me really happy, I have to say. <laughs> uh, anyway, so. Um, so text is data, being able to pull the questions out. Um, maybe the, the last one I'll mention um, we did for the public theater. 
I don't know how many of you, it's just here on the Lower East Side. Um, it's a chandelier. Um, there are uh, 27 blades, one for each of, 37 blades, one for each of Shakespeare's plays, um, sort of ar arranged uniformly around this um, ellipsoid. Um, 37 turns out to be a hard number because it doesn't go evenly into anything. If there had been 38 plays, that would have been great. 36 plays would have been fine. 37 is sort of hard. Um, but each, each, uh, each blade is a separate play. Um, and so here you get sort of the map of them. When you walk in the, the public theater on the left, the thing facing you is Hamlet, figuring that everyone would at least get that one right. And then it sort of gets more obscure as you go. Um, and this is the kind of thing that it does. Um, this is the end of a scene where we're basically just playing the, ho the whole set of plays. So they just stream out. And then um, over on the back is the end of Hamlet. Um, and in another scene, we um, again, each blade is only showing the, the content from one play. Um, so here what we're doing is looking at just the hyphenates that Shakespeare had in his plays. Um, Um, and then uh, at some point that'll go. And then another example here we're looking at um, the, the rhetorical structures that, that Shakespeare used. So um, every single word in every single play has been tagged with a part of speech. So we have the part of speech, we have the word, we have some theme. Is this water imagery? Does this have to do with the body? Um, so we're doing what we call a kind of anaphora mining, where we're mining for the, the rhetorical structures. Um, so here, it's, it's uh, uh, I mean, the pattern's kind of obvious. Um, so in this case, then, the, the part of speech, um, you know, as a, as a uh, a product of the California school system in the 60s and 70s, I could have maybe named seven parts of speech. Um, but the, uh, the product of the digital humanities, we have something in the order of 150 parts of speech in this particular uh, file. So, so each, each, uh, each word is given a, uh, one of these 150 or so parts of speech. Um, and, then, um, the, the, and then what we can do is look for patterns. So, for example, in all of Shakespeare's plays, there were 3,400 examples of DTJN1, which is a determiner, an adjective, and a singular noun. And if you pull out the determiner, adjective, and singular nouns from the, from the plays, you get a base descent, a base pander, a baser temple, and so on. And it's just sort of beautiful. Even So what we found is that it's really hard to un-Shakespeare Shakespeare, that you can kind of bang on it pretty hard, and it always remains nice. Yes. So the data, the data itself, no, the data come, so journalism is having its moment where it's going, there's data out there. And the things that we report on and the products of our reporting are becoming data. The humanities are maybe a half step ahead. So the digital humanities, things like paintings and novels and whatever, are now also seen as data and can be manipulated as data. So there's an XML. We talked about that on the first night. An XML specification for every single one of Shakespeare's plays where they've been tagged with these different parts of speech. Um, this is a product of somebody else's, probably some underpaid humanities graduate student spent hours and hours and hours working through this. Yes? Yeah. Like that Shakespeare project is really fascinating and cool. But what are some of the things that's happening in the digital humanities that are that are have more of a real world impact? Right. So what you're getting uh, so um, so places I could point you. Uh, Lev Manovich, who just who left San Diego State and is now here in the CUNY Graduate Center, has a project that he refers to as cultural analytics. Um, where he's looking at things like paintings and novels and figuring out what can you say about, about 
but, and, and for him, I think he's interested in the notion of style and the labels that we give to style being just sort of a product of our imagination, that maybe there's something about the way text is used or the way paint is applied or something like that that would, in a data way, emerge to give you a sense of style. Um, and then you get people like Franco Moretti at the Literary Lab at Stanford who's talk, who writes about um, what do you do, so humanities are really good at near reading material, meaning you read every line, so it's a, it's a near read, um, let's say of a novel or a handful of novels, but what happens if you talk about every novel, um, every British novel, let's say, you, 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 it's not possible to near read thousands of novels, and so instead you have to come up with tools that might help you, help you get a sense of what's there without reading them all, right? And he calls that distant reading. And distant reading is really a reflex of statistics, saying something about how documents cluster or not, um, how they come together or not, is there commonalities in the style of word usage and so on. And you're starting to see tools even emerge in journalism. There's a, Jonathan Stray has a project called Overview that is a way to take a large quantity of text, something you might get from a FOIA request or something, bring it in and see what's there, right? Rather than having to read thousands and thousands of pages, can you say, get some sense of where something interesting is happening computationally and then start to read? Does that make sense? Sure. Yep. Isn't that what, uh, is that <laughs> Sure, that's right. So if you're if you're doing if you're doing coverage, right? So I mean, it depends. I mean, this this goes back to the original the original lecture, which was about kind of the bias associated with data, right? So so your your results are only as good as the collection strategy you followed to get you there, right? Um, all right. One maybe one last project. This is something we did, um, and then I'll I'll shut up. Um, this is, a, again, text is data. Um, it was a commission that closed last summer. It was uh, a commission from eBay. Um, this is eBay corporate headquarters. And they wanted us to do something with the text of eBay, which is, um, it's, which is uh, not here, which is a list of um, uh, every item bought or sold on eBay for one day. So we got this beautiful text of people selling their stuff. Right, you know, the, and the crazy numbers they attach to how much it's worth. Right, so um, everything from you know faux diamond rings to bulk cat litter. Right, and it, it was a kind of poetry that I, I really I really love. Um, so we were asked to do something with that data. So uh, our our idea was as follows: um, we erected this big sale outside of their outside of their corporate headquarters. Um, this is the piece you can so you see the word clock. Right in the on the screen, um, and then there's like you can follow from clock up. You can see kind of an edge, and that sort of maps out the sale. Um, and uh, what we do is the following: the piece is called uh, "Before Us Is the Salesman's House." It's eBay, right? Before us is the salesman's house, huh? um, and it starts by reading um, "Death of a Salesman." Um, so uh, uh, it goes through and reads the first two paragraphs of "Death of a Salesman." Um, uh, and I think the, um, the third sentence is, uh, before us is the salesman's house. That's where we take the title. Um, and every time it comes across an object that you could buy on eBay or a similar sort of network, it pulls it off to the side. Um, and you could ask yourself, gosh, how would you identify from two paragraphs of text which things you could buy on eBay and which you couldn't? And for that, we use the Mechanical Turk. So we would send these two paragraphs off and ask people to tag which words. So like table or refrigerator, um, uh, bedstead, chair, um, so we read the first two paragraphs, identifying, uh, identifying these individual objects, um, uh, and then um, and then we start with the individual objects are numbered. So we start with each one um, and uh, run through an order, um, for example, figuring out where all the flutes are for sale in the United States. Um, and then uh, 
step and find the, where all the refrigerators are for sale and so on. We flatten this uh, sort of longitude on the x-axis. Not quite sure why longitude, but um, and then the y-axis is price, and then we look at a little bit of that language, like what's for sale. Um, and you can see there's an extremely expensive flute up there. So we sort of wander around and figure out what's, what's for sale. Um, after this, what we do is um, uh, we uh, go to a, uh, a, uh, uh, a zip code. Well, actually, flute goes, and then tables come in, and then we look at refrigerators and so on. And then what we find is a zip code where there's very little going on. Um, so a place where there's not much coming back and forth. And we pair it with another data set they gave us, which was every book bought or sold on eBay for the last two years. So we then switch over into books. We look at a, uh, all the books that are coming into or out of that small zip code. We pick one of those books. We put it up. We start reading its first two paragraphs, identifying its objects, and then it just keeps going. Right? So it sort of does this kind of random work, random walk, reading one data set that's eBay through another data set, which is a collection of books. In this case, everything we could find on Project Gutenberg, which is a little bit weird as a collection. But, um, uh, but anyway, so that's, that's, again, sort of text, text as data. Um, all right, so I'm going to stop there. So, so what we've done then um, over the last couple of lectures, hopefully, is given you a little bit of sense of R and how to use it. and. I, I promise you it gets better with drills, right? We keep asking, like even this evening, simple questions. How many of this are there? How many of that is there? Like, ask, start to ask yourself some simple questions. Um, the, the reason we're pushing R is because, um, is because it has, um, it seems to embed more sort of journalistic ethics than, a, than, a, than a, an Excel spreadsheet does in the sense that everything you do to data is listed there. Right? So you could give to your editor or somebody the data set and the code and say, check me. Right? Make sure that it's right. As opposed to a spreadsheet where it's very hard to keep track of everything that's happened on that spreadsheet during time. Um, R has consistent use of missing values, consistent, consistent, um, consistent, uh, uh, um, consistent uh, uh, sort of statistical procedures. Um, there's a whole lot of modeling tools that we haven't even you know, sort of been able to scratch the surface in three evenings. So there's a, a fair bit of stuff that you can do with the language um, that's, that's sort of not, not possible with spreadsheets. Um, uh, so we've gone through some of the basic R data types. We've gone through some of the basic functions for doing simple numerical calculations. I'm going to pass around or put on the, the DM, compute.cuj slash DM website um, a few cheat sheets, a few tutorials that can keep you doing more things. I mean, if there's one thing that I kind of suck at as an instructor, it's like keeping people fed with things to do. So um, we'll give you some tutorials to keep, uh, to keep, uh, to keep working. Um, Maybe that's all. Were there questions before we break? Anything? No? All right. So thank you. It's been three evenings. We'll.